Okay, welcome everyone to the OpenLMIS webinar series. My name is Tenley Snow. I'm the OpenLMIS Community Manager, and today um, we'll be presenting a demonstration of the Tupaya platform. Um, we have with us our uh, presenters, uh, Michael Noonan, he's the Tupaya Project Manager, and Edwin Monk Fromont, he's the Tupaya Software Lead, and then uh, myself as facilitator for today's presentation. Um, so just a couple quick notes about the webinar today. It is being recorded and the video will be made available on the OpenLMIS YouTube channel. Um, you'll be able to access that from the OpenLMIS Twitter, Wiki, and OpenLMIS.org, or you can write to us at info at OpenLMIS.org um, and request the link to that video, or you can just visit YouTube and search OpenLMIS and uh, the entire webinar series and other demo videos will pop up. So um, please go ahead and hold your questions. We'll have Q&A pauses after each of the sections on today's agenda. So there will be plenty of time to ask um, Edwin and Michael questions about everything that they're demonstrating. And we're really excited to have guy the guys with us today. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, just a quick overview of our agenda today. We'll be um, having a Tupaya overview then a demonstration of um, M-Supply and M-Supply Mobile. I don't believe this will be a live demo. It will be more like static screenshots with a discussion um, that Edwin and Michael will lead. Um, Edwin and Michael will then give a live Tupaya demo of their, um, of their site and platform. Uh, they'll talk a little bit about the software architecture behind the tool and um, future uses and potential extensions of Tupaya. Um, and then finally, we'll just have some quick closing remarks. So, without any further ado, um, Michael and Edwin, would you guys like to quickly introduce yourselves and then jump right in? Um, sure, yeah, so my name's Michael Noonan. I'm a pharmacist from Australia. I've um, worked in development um, for the past 10 years, mainly in um, Asia Pacific, in, in places like Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, um, Timor-Leste, but, um, I've done little bits of work in Africa as well, in, in Nigeria and Sierra Leone. Um, and yeah, um, I've, I've been working on um, this project we, we call Tupaya, which we'll, uh, which we'll explain today. Yeah, and I'm Edwin monk Fromont, so I'm the software lead on Tupaya. Um, I come from a background in computer science and uh, a few years ago now I joined, um, I joined uh, company which was making software to help people in the developing world um, and since then there's been no question about that being the right thing to do so um, Tupai is where we're at now and that's a really exciting project to be working on and thanks for having us along Tenley for this webinar and thanks everyone for joining whether that's live or watching the recorded version later. Thanks guys. Yeah, so let's go ahead and jump right into the Tupai overview and please just let me know when you'd like to switch slides. Um, we can just kind of jump right through those. So, sure. Well, I'll I'll jump in and, and give um, the various introductions and, and the background, um, and and Edwin can can then jump in and give the the more technical side of things. But the idea behind Chapire is, um, as this slide says, to to give visibility of a health system um, in a single kind of online platform and. Um, a couple of our primary design features were for Tupaya were to make it um, multinational. So, um, you know, bring together data across the region. And we've started in the Asia Pacific region, um, but it's, we, you know, we're agnostic about where it gets used. Um, and also that the information um, to the extent that is possible should be, should be shared. And so each of the participating countries um, has signed a data sharing agreement. And we actually show to the public um, some basic information. So the location of facilities, um, the services that they provide, their opening hours, and the staff that work there. And we, we said that was a real fundamental thing to, um, to engage people. Um, so yeah, what, what is Tupaya? It's, um, if you jump to the next slide, Tenley, um, Tupaya is a data aggregation system, essentially, that um, is supply chain focused, but is able to sync data from a variety of sources so that you can map your health system um, and present um, data dashboards that overlay, you know, various pieces of information, starting with um, LMIS and, and 
um, they're moving on to, to HIS, primarily through DHIS2. So currently we um, sync data from M-Supply, which is another LMIS system that some people would be familiar with. Um, they also have a mobile version, which we're going to demo very quickly today, or at least go through today. Um, so we sync data from M-Supply Mobile, M-Supply um, Desktop, and we use a data collection app called Tupaya Meditrack. Um, Tupaya Meditrack is, is free. It's available on the um, Google Play Store and iOS App Store. Um, we, we think it's a nice health data collection app. It's got a nice interface. There's nothing particularly amazing about Tupaya Meditrack. There's quite a few um, data collection apps um, out there. Um, Actually, if you go to the next slide now, Tenley, we've got uh, some screenshots of Tupaya Meditrack. Uh, so this is what the app interface looks like. Um, we've got clinic assessment is the main thing that we're, we're running with at the moment, which is where you come into a, a clinic or a health facility, it could be a hospital, it could be a smaller health centre, a rural aid post, anything like that. And within that clinic, you can then conduct different surveys. Um, and this is to capture data that's not captured or, already through existing software systems. So it's for facilities where... For example, we capture a lot of the LMIS data directly through the LMIS system that, they, that the facility will be using. But for those smaller facilities that aren't using an LMIS, we capture what medicines are available and whether they're in date or expired through a survey within this, within this Tupaya Meditrack tool. And it's also where we gather all of our uh, other information that's, that's outside of those systems. Um, so things like whether the facility is open today, which is a, a question you can see on screen there. Um, and the reason for that? Um, I mean, a lot of Tupai grew out of a need. So we, we were running health supply chains, um, but didn't know, for example, what services do particular facilities provide? Do they have a working fridge? Which staff work there? What's their electricity source? What's the nearest wharf to them? Um, all sorts of things that are important for running a supply chain, but not necessarily captured in a, in a typical um, LMIS. And from there, the idea kind of grew into overlaying all sorts of um, other data. So the screen you're looking at now is, is um, an aggregated dashboard um, at the national level. So we aggregate data at the national district and sub-district um, level. And these are some of the charts that, um, that are in those dashboards. So availability of, of critical medicines. You can look at medicines availability by individual clinic. Um, and what we're working on at the moment is drill down dashboards, um, which, we, which we expect to be working by January or February, where um, you'll be able to click through to the facility dashboards or more information on particular charts off these primary dashboards. Um, so they're, they're the national district and sub-district. So as you zoom in, it's their map-based tool. So what you're seeing on the map is the, is the data aggregated down the bottom in the dashboards. And as you zoom in further, those dashboards automatically update to, to show you um, data for that geographical view. And if you jump to the next slide, Tenley, um, you can then zoom into the individual facility level. So show um, dashboards for every facility. And that's a little hospital, um, little provincial hospital in Solomon Islands. Um, so you can see, um, yeah, the number of healthcare workers there, um, you know, whether their fridge is working, um, their, their medicines availability, stock on hand, and that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, the data is all, and I should address this right from the start, it's all password protected um, on tiered sort of level. So the public, without a login, can see very, very basic information. Um, and there's increasing levels of data that can be seen um, based on your authorization or your, your level of use, and it's all fully password protected. So countries that are concerned about data security um, we, we like to think need not be um, that, that you can, or the countries themselves own the data and they control who sees um, different bits of data. And the only thing that we ask all the participating countries to agree to is, um, as, as I say, the services that they provide, the location of the facilities, their opening hours and the staff that work there. And in most cases, that information is in the public domain anyway. So we're not asking them to share anything new. Um, if you jump to the next slide, Tenley, you can then map um, customizable indicators. So what we're looking at there is a map of working fridges in Solomon Islands. Um, this one's fairly easy. So green, they have a working fridge and red, they don't. Um, and you can see coverage there is, is reasonably good for um, yeah, cold chain infrastructure in Solomon Islands. But it allows um, 
for example, a supply chain manager to zoom into a facility that doesn't have a working fridge and try and identify what's, what's going wrong there. And, um, and you can also bring up all sorts of other information, the model of fridge, the electricity source they have, and your EPI manager could use this map to go and target those facilities where the fridge isn't working. The staff themselves can also self-report. So by having to buy Meditrack on their personal phone, um, if their fridge stops working, they can report that through to Biomeditrack and it will update the map in near real time so that, um, so that it kind of becomes a one-stop shop for, for all sorts of um, interesting bits of uh, information like that. And I think there's one more slide, Tenley, oh, there might be two more. So this is a cool new feature. So you can heat map medicines availability. So we use the HAI WHO um, methodology for measuring medicines availability. Um, so it's a percent, it's expressed as a percentage, but we use a basket of medicines to determine that rather than looking at every single medicine, which we think is a really strong methodology. And you can, you can map a country and show medicines availability across every, every facility. And that allows you to kind of visualize where you might have gaps, um, you know, in the system or, or um, you know, bottlenecks in the system that, that you can address more easily and, and being able to look at it visually like that. Um, opens up all sorts of other possibilities, not just medicines availability, but metrics around medicines usage, quality use of medicines, um, or tracking disease outbreaks and that sort of thing. And the final slide just showing the thing is, is being able to overlay HIS and LMIS data, which we think is really, really exciting. So at the moment where we sync from M Supply um, and, and Supply Meditrack and, and quite soon DHIS too, but we're pretty agnostic about what you know what we think from and so any LMIS any HIS system um, we we're happy to sync data from and then overlay it um, on top of each other so that you can you can start to for example marry up the number of malaria cases you've had with the number of anti-malarials you've used and do that right down to the facility level so you can um, identify um, problem areas but um, Tanya if you're able to share the screen to me I, I can try and do a live um, do a live demo of, um, of Tupaya. This is always um, risky. Um, if I click share screen. Yeah, this yeah. I see screen share. And then you should be able to do a screen share. Um, okay, let's try this. Share screen. And Yep, looks like it came through. Yeah. Um, so I'll just wait for that to disappear. Or oh, how do I move? Sorry, I should have practiced this earlier. If I click there, can you see Tupaya now on my screen? Yep, we can see it. Okay, so this is the global view for Tupaya. And as you can see, we aggregate data um, down the bottom across the region. So, um, one chart that we're quite happy with is, is showing medicines availability by country. This is de-identified, but it allows you to see how, um, how various countries are performing and allows the countries themselves, who are aware of which country they are, to see how they're performing against the regional average. And as I say, because we use the HAI methodology, the Health Action International methodology across every country, it's a standardised um, measure for, for reporting availability. So. Um, it's, it's quite a nice sort of view, but you can then zoom into the individual country level. So if we jump in and have a look at Vanuatu, it updates those dashboards down the bottom to show us um, aggregate information about Vanuatu. Um, you can then zoom into the district level and it automatically updates those dashboards to show you the district, each facility in the district and their medicines availability. And you can then zoom in even further. In Vanuatu, you can zoom into the sub-district level. And again, it automatically updates those, those dashboards to, um, to the view that you're looking at. So that's quite, that's, um, you know, quite a fun way of, of um, seeing the data. But the, one of the most interesting things is then being able to choose indicators that you're interested in. So if we look at working fridges in um, Vanuatu and zoom out, um, you can you can then see coverage of um, working fridges across the country, and again um, identify gaps in the system. We can map critical item availability with a heat map, 
and that allows a health planner to jump into a district that might be or a province that might be performing a little bit more weekly than others and try and identify whether that's just an anomaly or whether there's a real bottleneck happening in their second level medical store and target your resources more efficiently. And you can do that for individual commodities. So if we look at the availability of zinc sulfate, which is a really, really important treatment for diarrhea in kids under five, um, you can see those facilities which don't have it in stock. Rather than running a workshop or doing a, a touring exercise to every single facility and for every single nurse, which can be really, really expensive, you can identify just those facilities that, um, that don't have zinc sulfate and therefore assumedly aren't using it and go and target them with, with educational resources or um, further training. Bring up an individual facility dashboard um, and, and you know, try and identify problems in the system. And we can bring up individual facility dashboards for I think almost 900 facilities across Asia Pacific now. And we're hoping to, to kind of keep growing that. Um, so, um, I, I guess I can then just take over um, Tenley if, uh, if I can work out how to, how to um, present. There we go. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, great. So these are some of the recent updates that we've done to Tapai. For people who've seen it previously, um, these are kind of the new um, features. One of the ones that we're most excited about is the mobile version of the website. So um, you can now go to tupai.org on your phone and pull up all the same dashboards, all the same facility level dashboards, um, which is really, really important for people out in the field. And one of the, one of the big advantages of that is for disaster response. So that when a team is in the field and trying to um, locate facilities and identify the resources that facilities um, have and have lost, um, you know, they can do that from their mobile phone rather than having to find a, a desktop computer or you know, a laptop computer, which is um, which is a lot more difficult. Um, user registration is now easier, and there's a few new new charts, and you know we're trying to always add to the functionality and, and that sort of thing. The big question, of course, then is is meaningful use. So it's it's one thing to present pretty pictures and, and nice charts and um, you know so nice colours and all that sort of thing, but is it actually being um, used? This is this is one example that we think is. Um, is really interesting and, and it relates to zinc sulfate. This was a paper we published on zinc sulfate usage in Solomon Islands from 2013 to 2014. And this predates Tupia, but we use very similar principles to, to track zinc sulfate usage. Um, and we increased it um, over the course of that 12 months. I think we started at something like 13% um, and increased it up to 40% in that 12 month period. Um, Usage of zinc sulfate now we can track with Tupia in real time and it's up to 75% um, in Solomon Islands. So we don't need to try and get it published in a, in a peer reviewed journal, although you know, there's still obviously benefits to that. We don't need to go around and do really laborious data collection, and, um, spend weeks and weeks analyzing the data. We're getting this in real time and we can, we can overlay that with maps of zinc sulfate um, availability and actually um, you know, target resources to improve usage of what is a really cheap and really, really important um, intervention. Um, and then when you think about overlaying HIS with LMIS, there's all kinds of research questions that you could, that you could answer with them. And these are just some off the top of our head. Um, you know, real-time tracking of um, antimicrobial use, um, you know, overlaying contraceptive use with other, with other metrics, um, antimalarial resistance, um, is the, the type of animalarials matching the, the type of um, you know, malaria, the strains of malaria that they're getting in that area? Um, all, all sorts of questions like that. It's, it's really unlimited, I guess. Um, so I'll hand back over to Edwin now to, to demo and supply mobile. As I say, we're, we're agnostic about what we use to buy with, but at the moment, um, all the countries are using, using M supply, and we, we hope to expand on that. And I should answer straight up the question of, how much does to buy a cost? It's it's free. So the basic package is free. The the, the existing dashboards that you can see and all the charts um, and, and everything are free. Obviously, customizations we we cost out. Um, and if you want to do anything unusual, um, you know, we cost that out and we can do that. But if you know if people have their own developers and and want to, for example, sync in data from another data collection app, 
or from another LMIS system, we've got no problem with that. We think that would be, would be great. And, um, and they can go off and do that and use it in whatever interesting ways they like. So Edwin, I'll, oh, sorry, yeah, go on. No, it's fine. I was just going to say, Edwin, before you get started, just wanted to let folks know that we'll do a quick um, Q&A pause after the M Supply and M Supply mobile demo. So um, I'm sure there are some questions, but um, Edwin, go ahead and, and talk a bit about M Supply, M Supply mobile, and then um, we'll pause for questions. Yeah, sure. And in the meantime, if anyone wants to type in any questions into the chat window um, to have them sitting there, then there's two presenters. So one of us can think about the answer while the other presents, and that's fine as well. Um, so this is M Supply. This is a view of M Supply, which is an LMIS. And for the Tupaya project, we collaborated with the company that makes M Supply, who are called Sustainable Solutions. And we did that because Tupaya is focused on the Pacific initially. Um, it's a project that's funded by the Australian government, uh, an organization called DFAT. Um, and so around the Pacific, nine out of the 13 countries in the Pacific are using M Supply as the LMIS for the um, pharmaceutical uh, supply chain. Uh, so M Supply, as you can see there, we've got all of the different features that you might expect in an LMIS. There's a uh, customer, there's the different tabs across the top, uh, the customer, and that's for sending, sending goods out. Um, suppliers for both tendering um, and also receiving supplies. Uh, item is for just configuring your items, looking at your stock, that sort of thing. Report so that you can analyze uh, what's going on. Um, and then there's a couple of configuration tabs as well. And this has been used now for 15 years in, um, around the world. I think it's used by about uh, coming up to 40 countries in total. Um, but it's got really strong um, support in the Pacific. And so it made sense for us as people who are interested in the availability of medicines throughout the Pacific to partner with M Supply and with Sustainable Solutions and use that as our first, um, our first point of data because when we use M Supply, then it means that we don't just have a one-time snapshot of medicine availability and of consumption and of those other quantifiable things. We've got live, um, consistently updating data. And so we can see at any point in time um, how medicine availability is going. And we can, see, um, we can see that track over time as well. So we can very easily do longitudinal capture of that data. So that's the M Supply desktop system, and that's been used for a long time, as I say, around 15 or, or maybe 17 years now. And we've now got M Supply Mobile in use. Um, and so M Supply Mobile is an offline app. It's used on Android tablets, and it's being used in, uh, I'm not sure of the number, Michael, do you know? It's maybe a couple of hundred facilities around the Pacific. I think that's right. I think it's about 150 to 200 facilities around the Pacific are using M Supply Mobile. And M Supply Mobile was, um, was initially released in 2013 and used in the Solomon Islands. Uh, but at that stage, it was a web based app. Um, and so you needed internet to use it. And anyone who's worked in the Pacific, or I'm sure in a lot of other developing countries, knows that you cannot rely on the internet. And so they turned it into an offline app. Um, so now you can do everything through the native app that you might want to do in a smaller health facility. So receiving goods, uh, requisitioning goods, and that can, those requisitions are based on quantification done automatically through the app. Uh, issuing goods to customers, and that can be customers including patients, obviously that's the main one, um, but also other lower level facilities if there's a hierarchical supply chain that goes down a few tiers. And you can also see what the current stock is, which is cons constantly updating based on your interaction with issuing and receiving goods. And you can do a stock take as well. And so you can see that there's a sync enabled sign icon up the top right of that screen. And so whenever there's internet available, it will synchronize with the main M Supply server in the country. And that will then synchronize that data up to tupaya.org. And so in that way, even at these low level facilities dotted all throughout the country, we get regular data capture and we understand what, um, what the medicine availability is like for certain critical items, well actually for every item at all of those facilities. And so we can do, um, we can quite easily do, um, we can map that availability uh, and we can compare facilities as well. Now one thing we needed to work on for this project was to be able to compare data, that sort of medicine availability data, across countries because obviously this is a pacific wide project and could even extend further and so for that you need to have 
a common set of identifiers so that when you're looking at a medicine, say amoxicillin in Solomon Islands, you can compare that with the same amoxicillin in Vanuatu. Um, now at the moment, there's quite a push to use those sort of standardized methods and that's absolutely fantastic because that's really what we need to be able to do these cross country comparisons. We used a method um, that was developed by Sustainable Solutions for this purpose which they call the Universal Codes. Um, it's available open source online. Anyone can contribute pro to it or, um, or benefit from it. Um, and it's basically just a, a coding standard that gives every one of the, um, the items that are on there so far a unique identifier that we then load into to Pyre and we can identify the same, um, the same medicine across all of those different countries. We did look at GS1, just I'm sure a few of you are questioning whether GS1 was an option, but unfortunately GS1, um, it kind of identifies medicines at a lower level than what we require, because we want to be able to look at every amoxicillin um, across different countries, whereas GS1 it attaches also supplier information. So the identifier is for quite a specific item, which is not just that, that drug uh, class and an item, but also, um, or even just the strength, um, but also attaches the information about the supplier. So at that level, uh, that's a level we're not we're not interested in. So we're not comparing just the um, the amoxicillin that comes from a certain supplier. We're comparing every amoxicillin. And to, so to jump in there, Edwin, and explain that for people who um, might be looking at GS1 and looking at you know what it does there's no gs1 code the way that we understand gs1 for amoxicillin 500 milligram tablets or capsules um there there's gs1 codes for acme branded amoxicillin 500 milligram capsules or tablets um and there's a gs1 code for um universal healthcare amoxicillin 500 milligram capsules or tablets but there's no key that links those two codes together so you can very very specifically identify um the supplier the brand you know all that sort of thing about the individual product but um but there's no key that kind of links them back to a universal um item which is the you know which is the generic amoxicillin 500 milligram capsules or tablets yeah thanks mike and i guess we are going down this side avenue a little bit, but while we're on it, I might as well mention that also the other issue was that there was no central repository for GS1 codes. So we don't know that there's any place that you can go and say, okay, I've got this, um, I've got this item. What's the GS1 code for it? Unless you get that directly from the supplier, there's no, um, there's no central repository that, that kind of collates all of the GS1 codes that exist for, for pharmaceutical supplies. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there is a question from um, Josh Zamor, who's our, the OpenLMIS architect. Um, he said, have you looked at the UNSPSC or GPC um, identifiers? Michael, I might hand that one over to you because you looked into a few, didn't you? Um, look, I, I can't talk to that individual one. We, we couldn't find a coding system that, that met exactly our needs. We looked quite closely at the ATC codes. Um, they obviously don't work because um, an individual product can have two ATC codes where it has multiple um, indications. I, I can't talk too intelligently to, um, to that other one you mentioned, Tenley. But honestly, we're really super agnostic about what system we end up with. The, the M Supply or the, the Sustainable Solutions Universal Code um, works well for our current kind of needs. But you know, I, I know for a fact that they're also really, um, they're super open to other ideas as well. You know, whether, um, whether they use another universal coding system or whether they just link their universal codes through a key to GS1 or whatever. I don't think anyone in this industry cares about which standard it is we end up using. Everyone just wants to see a, a useful standard. So any, um, anything that anyone can send us on that, we're more than happy to read, absolutely, yeah. And I've just linked through the uh, universal code system that we did use, uh, in case anyone's interested in looking at that. I, I, I think from memory that the, yeah, the UNSPC codes possibly only identify the item, so they don't identify the strength, you know, or the, or the dosage form. So for example, this is, my, this is my understanding that the UNSPC or UNSPSC codes will identify paracetamol, 
but they won't identify paracetamol 500 milligram tablets, paracetamol 100 milligram tablets, paracetamol 250 milligram suppositories. It's just a code for paracetamol. Um, and obviously if you're running a supply chain, you need more information than that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's actually um, probably, we've kind of moved into the Q&A, but we can move to the next slide and, and oh, sorry. Yeah. a little bit more Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, we're happy to take them. Well, just, just since we are discussing that, it's, um, so this is Josh. Uh, and if you're interested in talking about UNSPSC or GPC, I, I could certainly talk how we're thinking about, you know, the, the way that you solve the problem, you can also kind of solve it with UNSPSC and GPC. Um, so I could talk to that if you're interested. Um, sure. No, absolutely. We're, yeah, we're genuinely interested in it. Yeah. Okay. So just really briefly high level, um, you're right. UNSPSC and, and GPC don't identify the things that you're really looking for, which is kind of a generic name and also, um, you know, a, kind of a delivery factor, you know, it's, it's a pill, it's 500 milligrams, it's an injection, you know, that sort of thing. But they do get to those classifications and they get to those classifications that you can also use for, you know, rolling up into higher level reporting systems. So they're hierarchical systems. So if you did a cost-based analysis and you counted, you know, if you went all the way down in GS1 and you said you captured uh, this G10, you know, this particular GS1 identifier, which is identified from a manufacturer, then you can roll those up into systems like UNSPSC or GPC. And then those identifiers will further roll up within those systems um, because they are hierarchical themselves. And from there, uh, hopefully, hopefully this is coming through, but from there you can, you know, say, well, the cost within pharmaceuticals or pharmaceuticals malaria treatment, you know, is, is this or that. Um, and the way that you get your, your uh, delivery factor comes through by genericizing what comes from the manufacturer. So, uh, you know, if the manufacturer says, you know, I, this is my G10, which is some identifier, uh, is this thing, which is like Advil, you know, 500 milligrams, the, the, you know, et cetera. Well, Advil rolls up into G, you know, GPC or UNSPSC is, is essentially ibuprofen. And in the middle there is the, the collected information or the um, collective information, I guess I could say, that the delivery factor or the form factor is, you know, pills of 500 milligrams. So that's kind of, you know, I mean, there's multiple uses there. It's kind of how you can f take that and fit it into your use case. Um, just anyways, some information. Yeah, no, thank you. And I, I think, um, yeah, probably um, also what you're alluding to is that the, the final kind of, or the, the end game with this will be, will be actual combinations of, of these coding systems. Because as you, as you kind of imply, different coding systems have different purposes and, and um, not necessarily mutually exclusive. So yeah, I think rolling them up into, into another um, coding system is quite a good way of, of putting it. We, we've talked about, yeah, linking them with a key and that sort of thing. So um, it's, it's not an easy area by any stretch. Yeah. And, and one, one, I guess the big advantage that ideally we all get out of GS1 and, and UNSPSC and all those is that ideally that information comes from the manufacturers. So if the supply chain is, is working very well, then I guess we could say that the manufacturers would be advertising their wares and saying, in a, in a UNSPSC system or in a GP system, my product falls under the following identifiers. And then, you know, it kind of rolls up all the way from the source, you know, to the, from the source of people who are, are making things and then putting those things into other organizations which are doing those classification and coding systems for, for whatever. Totally. For. Totally. And, I, and I think that helps to avoid confusion and avoid errors on um, tender bidding, on advanced shipping notices and all sorts of things because you know very, very exactly that we are talking about the same thing if, the, if, there's, um, if they're using it exactly like you say. Right, yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I guess that's a that's a whole um, that's a rabbit hole we could disappear down for the um, for the rest of the webinar. But it's um, but it's it's interesting stuff, and it does help to give a background, I guess, to um, to how we report across countries. Yeah. 
Are there any other questions? We've got more presentation to go. This is just a, a brief pause for any questions about what we've talked on so far. Cool. Okay. Well, um, jumping back to Tapai, I, I guess I, I have um, yeah already demoed it. The, the funnest and easiest way for people to to understand Tapai is to go to it. As I say, you you don't need a login. You can go to um, tapai.org um, and jump on and start um, peering around what is publicly available data. If you want to see everything that um, Tapai can do. There's a fake country that's that sits out in um, just off the Australian coast called Demoland. So if you go to tobuy.org, you'll see Demoland. Um, I can uh, I can jump to it now, quite possibly if I do this, um, and then come into here and reset to my global view. Um, you can see Demoland there, sort of halfway between Rockhampton and New Caledonia, we, we tell people. And if you zoom into Demoland, you, you don't need a login for that. It's a completely fake country. All the data is fake. Um, it's got rivers and streams and lots of fake people. And, and it's a really good way of, of exploring what um, what Tupaya can do. So, so um, yeah, it's quite good. If you, if you download Tupaya Meditrack, so that's M-E-D-I-T-R-A-K, off the Google Play Store or the or the App Store, um, you can also enter data for Demoland. So it doesn't actually populate what's on Tupai.org, but you can see how the how the surveys work and play around with usability a little bit and um, and see some of the things that we collect um, as a standard. Um, but it's um, yeah, as I say, it's 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 a bit of fun, and, and we like to use Demoland as a as a nice way of kind of showing off how it how it works. You can also register as a user um, through the app now, um, which is one of the new kind of functionalities we've added. So um, if you download to Track and request access to a certain country, um, the countries have to approve that access, but they're often quite happy um, for donors to get access to, a, to a, more information than the public can see. Not as much as an executive level user can see, but we, yeah, we've got something called donor level access. Um, and if you can, yeah, we can ask the countries on your behalf for for permission to to access that, and they're usually um they're usually pretty. And just to note, for those that might be visiting tupaya.org on their uh, mobile, we we took care with the mobile version of the site to be um to be a little bit savvy with how much data we are pushing to people's phones, and also with um how much. Uh, how much processing power that people's phones might be, particularly in the context we work in, people in the Pacific may not have phones that are up to um, up to panning around and zooming through a map. So we did actually remove the, the map from the mobile version of the website. So you won't see that on your mobile phone. You'll see it on the, on the desktop site, but not on the mobile phone. On the mobile phone, we just have static maps, which give you a sense of where you are, but we've made it really accessible so that the data itself is, is front and center on the mobile version. Um, the same dashboards are all available. They don't load immediately. You, you need to click open, open dashboard. And again, that's to preserve people's data um, in these contexts. But the, all the information, the same information is available there, just not the map overlays. <clears throat> That's only available on the desktop site. So. That's right. And we, and we should also say with compatibility for Tupai Meditrack, so this is the data collection app, um, seems to be pretty universal. It'll, it'll work on any Android or iOS, and we've, we've used it on $70 smartphones, you know, purchased um, you know, from street vendors and, and it seems to work fine. So it's, um, hopefully there's no compatibility issues. So if anyone does have issues, we'd, we'd be curious to hear about them if that, if that comes up. Um, and again, I'll palm back to Edwin here to talk very briefly about the, the software architecture that kind of underlies Tupai. Yeah, so I guess the, um, the key message from this slide is to take out that, that we can collect data from a variety of different sources and we aggregate that using DHIS2 and then we present it on the Tupaya website. So if we look at the, the specifics around this slide, we've got countries that use mSupply and countries that don't use mSupply. So for example, Fiji up the top left is a country that doesn't use mSupply. Now it's not actually on the website yet, um, but we intend to map that this year. Oh, sorry, next year, 2018. Um, 
but we wouldn't be getting any data from end supply in that country. We'd be getting all of the data just from Tupaya Meditrack. Uh, in a country with end supply, like Vanuatu down the bottom left, we've got data coming in from end supply mobile and from end supply desktop into the end supply server. Um, and then that sends data straight to DHIS2. And we collect other peripheral information or actually quite important information, but not related to the LMIS data um, through Tupaya Meditrack. Um, and that can be um, all of those all of those other bits of information, but also for sites that don't run in Supply Mobile, maybe the smaller sites. Um, and so all of the Meditrack data goes first to a um, Tupaya Meditrack server, which keeps all of the data that's been collected through surveys on the surveying app. So that's quite distinct from our data aggregation. And it just in that way acts like another data input to our aggregation server, which is the DHIS2 instance. So essentially, that's not just when Michael says we're agnostic about where the data comes from, that's been designed right through to the software architecture level. So that the data that comes in from our surveying app goes into a separate server before it gets into our, our aggregation instance. So it is treated just the same as any other data input might be. And you can imagine many more arrows going down this, uh, going down this page, coming into the aggregation server from a variety of sources. Obviously, the, um, the, the interesting one for you would be open LMIS feeding data in, and we don't imagine that that would be a hard task. Um, but also DHIS2, if the country is also running DHIS2 as the HIS, uh, then we can pretty easily feed information from that directly into our aggregation server because it is just another DHIS2 instance. Um, and obviously, all the data comes out of that and is presented on the tupaya.org website. So that's the, that's the software architecture. If there are any questions on that, I'm happy to take them. Maybe no a quick, quick question. Oh, could yeah, I, sure. can I ask verbally? Is that okay? Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Uh, great. I, I was just wondering, f for the codes that we were mentioning earlier, so those, all, of the, number, all the numbers aggregate up into DHIS2, where, where does the code server or the code list, where does that live? Well, we've got, so that's provided by Sustainable Solutions. And so we use their website, which is, uh, I posted a link a little bit up the chat, uh, universalcodes.nsupply.org.nz. Um, so that's the central repository where the codes come from. But we haven't had to do much with the codes. All we have to do is apply them to the uh, surveys we're taking from Tupaya Meditrack, which is just one place. Sustainable Solutions have applied those same codes in each of the M Supply instances. So it's the, the individual data, um, data sources that do the attaching of the codes to the items in them. And so that by the time it gets to DHIS2, they're already identified using that universal system. Okay, thanks. No problem. Cool. Another, okay. another cool, question. Yeah, if, if live questions are okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, my name's Brandon and the quick question is about Maybe going back to your slide about the diagram of the different pieces of the ecosystem here, it looks like the Metatrack server and the Tupaya web server are like two very different pieces and that both can run on AWS. Um, I guess, could you explain a little more, earlier you talked about how Tupaya was free. Um, explain a little more, is it, is it like a free Android app with a subscription model where the country would sign up for a subscription or is the model more that they would like post it on their own AWS, they download the software and run it like they'd be able to get the source code or is, is part of it really more of a subscription model like you all kind of run and host the Tupaya web tools for countries and they sign up to use it. No, so it's absolutely free that we don't have any subscription model. Um, we, we run these AWS servers and they, so everyone goes through the same server at this stage. A country would obviously have to pay to host their own server if they wanted data that was just, for, that was, for example, a, a custom Tupaya website just for their country. Um, and we have had requests of that nature that we're looking into, but for the, 
for the kind of global tupaya.org website, none of this costs anything. So a country can collect all the data they like through Tupaya Meditrack. They can push it up to the Tupaya Meditrack server. Um, that can then push it across to Tupaya Web. It can be displayed on dashboards, and that would all cost a total of zero dollars and no ongoing fees at all. Okay, thank you. I mean, in addition to that, we've we've talked about making Tupaya Meditrack the app open source. Um, we will probably do that in the next few months. Um, we, we kind of don't see anything, as I, as I said at the start, we think Tupaya Meditrack is a really nice health data collection app. We make it available for free, but um, but is it any better than, than you know Fulcrum or Kobo or um, SurveyMonkey or you know it's probably not. It's you know it's got all the basic um, data collection tools. Um, and a nice interface and um, and people have their own preferences and and so um, you know we, we kind of don't see any great um, value in selling a data collection app so we, we just make it available for, for free and we should really acknowledge um, <laughs> right from the outset that this project has been funded um, primarily by DFAT the Australian aid program um, through the innovation exchange um, and and obviously that's another reason that we started in Asia Pacific because that's very much where Australia's aid effort is focused. But it does allow us to kind of expand out from there because the, the development was all funded through IXC. Yeah. This is Matt, it's hard to be, I'm not trying to come across as cheeky, but what's your uh, sustainability model? Because <clears throat> that- uh, no, it's, no, it's not cheeky at all. It's, um, it's a really commonly, um, really commonly asked question. Um, Look, we, you know, having developed this, um, we are obviously interested in maintaining it and improving usability. We get work out of consulting in the countries that we that we go into and through customizations. So different countries have already requested us to customize dashboards and obviously we, we charge for that. Um, but we try to, if a country has requested a customization, um, we try to make that then available to everyone. Um, you know, where, where possible and, and countries so far have been quite good about that. Um, we also see sustainability in different donors using the data in different ways. So we've started talking to, um, to donors, for example, if you had a, a UNFPA who was interested in reproductive health commodities, so we would customise dashboards for UNFPA and they would um, possibly um, then contribute to the ongoing maintenance of of Tupaya. I'm not saying that UNFPA has, has agreed to that, but that's, you know, that's, that's the kind of model that we, that we see that larger donors, particularly donors like World Food Program, UNICEF, who are moving commodities around and are interested in LMIS data overlaid with HIS data would, would yep. contribute to the, the project. Cool. Yeah, we struggle with all the same challenges, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, well, this is it. Um, okay, so um, I'll kind of jump ahead if there's no more questions for now. Um, we, you know, what next? Sort of why are we, why are we presenting on this and, and where do we see um, Tupaya going? Um, we, we think we've, we've built it to quite a good point now um, for a limited range of data sources and we're now keen, you know, to, to expand that or at least for people to see um, what we're doing. We know that Overlaying HIS and LMIS is, um, you know, is, is gaining a lot of traction around the world and, and we're kind of putting this up as a model for how um, various systems could do that. So we're, we're quite open to integrating with other LMIS platforms, um, partnering with other countries, um, and also kind of getting ideas from people about new and interesting ways in which the, the dashboards and the, and the charts can be, can be used. We've, we've really approached it from a supply chain perspective I'm a pharmacist, so you know a lot of it is focused very much on on pharmaceuticals, rational use of medicines. But you know, every time we have informal conversations with people, people throw up really interesting ideas of how we could use the data or how we could analyze it in different ways. And, and we're really, really open to those ideas because um, we tend to live inside our own bubble, as as everyone does. And um, and so you know, we, we're kind of keen to to you know expand what it does because we we see it being used as as a data platform for, for all those things, system strengthening and research and all, and all those sorts of things. Um, yeah, that, um, that hopefully can, can help, a, help a few people.
Um, so I guess that yeah, that brings us to our, our final Q and A. Unless Edwin, you had anything to to jump in with or, or add to the. the no, basic but, but I mean, we're happy to have open discussion, and I'm happy to talk to anything that people have questions on. Yeah, hi, this is Mary Jo. Um, I'm the product manager of OpenLMS, and I wanted to thank you for giving this demonstration and overview of the products and um, solutions, by solution. I think there are folks that aren't on the call today that would be interested in seeing and reviewing this, some of the implementations of OpenLMIS that are already out there um, specifically. So I think more questions might come offline and not necessarily right now. So just, you know, we have like a smaller group of folks who are um, based in the U.S. on the call at the moment. But I want to, to thank you, and, and I'm sure we'll follow up with more questions later on, but this is really interesting to see, and, and kind of, um, personally, I have some questions around uh, the data sharing agreements that you were talking about in the onset, if that was a challenge at all, um, and what that experience was like. I don't know if you guys were facilitating that, or if it was um, yeah, no, that's a good question. I, you know, one of the advantages of starting the Pacific in the Pacific and anchoring this in in pharmacy departments and pharmacy divisions and medical stores in the Pacific is the Pacific is not a huge place population wise, and and I have been working in the Pacific for ten years. I have a lot of um, you know personal relationships, um, and you know, there's a lot of trust between between us, the countries, and and sustainable solutions, and. To be honest, we haven't had too many problems with the data sharing agreements, but if we were to go to a completely new country where we have no relationships, um, asking them to kind of take it on faith that we're going to protect their data may well be a lot more difficult. Yeah, it's, um, it's you know, we try to emphasize as much as possible in the, in the data sharing agreement that they own the data. Um, they can pull out of Tupire at any time and they control what gets shared. Um, and, and we just ask that they that they agree to those those four things to be viewed publicly, and then they control what is seen by donors in their country and what is seen by executive level users um, in their country. And there's very very good reasons for that. You know, if you're running a medical stores, you don't necessarily want every out of stock, you know, plastered all over the internet because you'll be on the front page of the paper every day, and that's totally understandable. You know, people should be sensitive about this data. We don't collect any patient level or patient identifiable data. At the moment, um, and that would be a whole another level of, of you know, data security um, questions. At the moment, everything is de-identified, and and it's it's fairly metadata in a lot of ways that we that we're collecting and displaying. But um, but you know, we we want countries to feel comfortable that, that their data is going to be secured. So um, yeah, it's it's I, I think you're alluding to something that's really really true. It's so built on on relationships and and trust and. Um, and whilst we haven't had any problems so far, who yeah, who knows what would happen if we if we went somewhere? Yeah, and to follow up on that, um, I guess one other thing is the scalability of this. I'm not sure what amount of data you're currently working with, but it sounds like DHIS two is serving as kind of your data pipeline or processing. Um, platform before it reaches to Paya. Curious if you guys foresee any concerns or issues with scalability. Um, you know, I was at the DHIS2 symposium last year and um, using DHIS2 as an aggregator for like transactional data, um, there seemed to be some concerns with scalability. We didn't know if you guys have done any um, performance testing or load testing to to bring this to maybe a doubling the scale that you're currently at right now. Yeah, well that's a that's I mean scalability is an always is always an interesting question. I actually didn't know that about DHIS2 that the people had run into uh, issues with high load. But uh, so far we haven't had any issues. We haven't done we haven't tried to for example, double the load, but along the way we have, you know, we've come from zero to um, close to a thousand facilities now with data in there. Um, so that it's something like uh, 400,000 data points so far. Um, 
And so we haven't run into any issues so far with DHIS2. There have been other scalability things which just happen naturally as you grow. Well, one, of, one part of our model is obviously we're sitting on cloud infrastructure, so it's easy to scale in terms of the hardware we're using. Um, another thing we did was in the, within the Tupaya Meditrack um, data pipeline, we uh, swapped out the database we were using by underneath the hood, um, and that's improved our, our scalability there. Um, and so we've got, um, we, we do have a model that we can change things. It's, the software's been designed in a way where there, in some ways it's a microservices architecture. Um, it's very encapsulated, different distinct modules. Um, and so we can swap things out as, as we run into troubles. Um, and as I say, with AWS, it's very easy to increase the, um, increase the performance of the actual hardware that's sitting on. Um, as for DHIS2, I'm gonna look into that now that you've flagged it, um, and we'll see how we go. Yeah, I, I think it, it does raise a good point that, you know, Tupaya and DHIS2 are not transactional, um, you know, software systems. And, and we definitely wouldn't recommend um, that, that people try to use them as such. I know some people have tried to do that with DHIS2 and, and kind of configure it to be um, a transactional system. And I know they've run into problems with that, not even necessarily because of the scale, but just because that's not what it's, um, what it's designed for. So we're definitely not recommending um, yeah, that, that Tupaya would ever capture transactional data, more that we, yeah, we capture that kind of aggregate information. Again, this is really, really helpful. And I think as we dig through and look through your demo site more and more, we might have follow-up questions. Would it be okay if we reached out to the two of you directly or how best should we funnel questions? Yeah, of course. Actually, Michael, if you flip to the next slide, um, I've got the, the kind of generic email there, admin at tupaya.org. Um, that, that one will go to both Michael and I. So if you email that and we can get in touch with you directly uh, and happy to answer any follow-up questions, of course. Um, we're also, as everyone is these days, on, on social media. So on Twitter, I think we're Tupaya Health, and on Facebook, we're Tupaya Health Data Collection. Um, and, and anyone who's got you know more generic questions, of course, post them on our on our social media, and we'll we'll get to them as quick as we can. What does uh, Tupaya mean? Oh, I was meant to say this at the start. It's my favourite part about the whole project. Um, yeah, Tupaya was a Polynesian um, navigator. So he joined Captain Cook's crew in, in 1769. Um, he's from an island near Tahiti. And um, he, uh, he was able to navigate the Pacific using the stars, the tides, um, bird life, um, you know, cloud patterns. And he was able to do that a lot more accurately than the Europeans could at the time with their, with their then modern instruments. And, and he helped Captain Cook um, yeah, navigate the Pacific on that, on that very famous um, tour around there in, in 1769, but he died in Java in 1770, um, quite tragically on, on his way back to Europe. And, um, and so it's kind of, yeah, named after, named after him, continuing that tradition of, yeah, of mapping. Cool, thanks. I'm, I'm very glad you asked that, because I would have been kicking myself for forgetting it. <laughs> well, we get a free history lesson along with our um, wonderful demo today. That's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, okay, great. Well, I guess we might go ahead and wrap up. Um, any questions, like Michael and Edwin said, can be directed to admin at tupaya.org. Um, you can also reach out to the OpenLMIS community at info at openlmis.org if you have further questions about um, OpenLMIS or the webinar that you saw today. Um, and so we'll go ahead and close the webinar. Just wanted to give one final thanks. Uh, to Edwin and Michael um, for presenting on Tupaya. It was a fantastic presentation, guys. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Tanley. And, and yeah, thanks to Open Alamias and, and thanks to you as well, Tanley. It's, um, it, we, we love talking about it and, and we're loving, uh, yeah, kind of showing it off now that, now that we've, we've got it up and running. So yeah, very, yeah, very grateful to you. Yeah, it's really exciting. Thanks so much, guys. All right, take care. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.